As you know, the, um, the theme of this convention is a culture of freedom. Three very important elements of our culture, as you know, are sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> Sounds like a campaign platform to me. <laughs> our panelists today will discuss their views on where we've been, where we are, where we're going in these areas and whether we're making progress toward more freedom or whether we're losing ground. Each of our four panelists is eminently qualified to be participating here today. Dr. Walter Block is senior economist at the Fraser Institute of Vancouver, British Columbia, and director of its Center for the Study of Economics and Religion. A member of the British Columbia Association of Professional Economists, the Canadian Econ Economic Association, numerous other economic societies, he has worked in various research capacities for the National Bureaus of Economic Research, the Tax Foundation, and Business Week. <coughs> Dr. Block has published numerous popular and scholarly articles on economics. He is a regular contributor to the Financial Post, Grain News, and writes a syndicated column for Australian newspapers. An economic commentator on national television and radio, he lectures widely on public policy issues to university students, service, professional, and religious organizations. He is the editor of numerous Fraser Institute books, but it is his authorship of Defending the Undefendable that has probably earned him a place here on this panel today. And he will be autographing copies of his book at the Laissez-Faire Books uh, booth after this event. As you probably guessed, he's first on the list. He'll be speaking on sex. Somebody's in favor of it. Good. That's good. <laughs> Our second speaker, Dr. Robert Anton Wilson, is a novelist, poet, playwright, lecturer, stand-up conk, and futurist and psychologist. In science fiction, he is the co-author with Robert Shea of the Illuminatus Trilogy, which is my first exposure to him. He won, that won him the 1986 Prometheus Hall of Fame Award. He is also the author of Schrodinger's Schroding, Cat Trilogy, and among his historical novels are The Earth Will Shake, The Widow's Son, and Masks of the Illuminati. He holds a PhD in psychology from Hawthorne University. He edited the Playboy Forum Department for Playboy for six years. His nonfiction works of the futurist psychology and guerrilla ontology include Prometheus Rising and Right Where You Were Sitting Now. His latest books are a novel, Nature and Man, Nature's God, and a polemic against fundamental materialism, the new inquisition. He has also made a comedy record and a punk rock record, which I suppose also helped get him on this panel today. He will be uh, also available at Laissez-Faire Books after this panel. And our third panelist is also a doctor of a different sort, I think. <laughs> Dr. Demento is... <laughs> How many have heard his radio show? Yeah. His actual name is Barry Hansen. I don't know if I'm supposed to divulge that, but he's host of the Dr. Demento Show, a weekly program of comedy and novelty recordings heard on 180 stations via the Westwood One radio network, and he is a Southern California resident. What I'd like to do, well, he's speaking on rock and roll, basically. Like mentioned that. What I would like to do, the format, is to have each one of our speakers come up and discuss their particular topic in order, and then we'll open the floor for, for questions and let you have at them. So why don't we start with uh, Dr. Walter Block on sex. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. What I would like to do is to begin by explaining or perhaps defending the entire topic of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. There immediately arises a criticism. Why have a, a, a panel on such a, a negative topic? I mean, this is really... <laughs> You know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, yucky. I mean, this is, it's not going to uh, play in Peoria. The middle class won't like it. It won't help promote libertarianism. It'll be seen as a negative. Uh, surely libertarians can illustrate their principles with more acceptable examples, the criticism might go. In this regard, uh, recently there was made, a great play made of the concept macho flash. And I think that if anything fits that criticism, this is it. Uh, there was a strong criticism of just of doing things uh, just of this sort on the grounds that this is macho flash and it'll be uh, counterproductive. 
uh, it'll be a turnoff. Uh, the chief uh, examples of the macho flashing that were used uh, to exemplify this principle were my book, Defending the Undefendable, and Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand was seen as a macho flasher, and this was supposed to be a turnoff for libertarianism. Uh, you can imagine what I think of that concept. I'm against macho flash, I, or I, I favor doing it. I think that it's highly productive. I think that if Ayn Rand is accused of this and I'm uh, put in her category, I'm certainly in good company when it comes to promoting libertarianism. Let me just uh, pull a little quiz on you to see uh, to what extent or what effect Ayn Rand has had an influence on libertarianism. Would those of you who have been affected by her uh, either greatly or slightly to your present positions, please raise your hand. Okay, so we see how evil macho flashing is in terms of promoting libertarianism. It's not evil at all. I think the point that we have to realize is methodological individualism. People are different. It's true, some people are turned off by sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Some people are turned off by uh, defending the undefendable. Other people are turned off by many things. There is no one way to convert people to libertarianism. And this is as good a way as any, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll for certain types of people. Now, defending the undefendable was motivated by the idea that we shouldn't shrink from defending the hard cases of libertarianism. It's easy to defend libertarianism on the easy cases. It's harder to do with the more difficult cases. And if we can do it in the more difficult cases, the point is that we can uh, have a more robust defense of our philosophy. Uh, I think that our philosophy, libertarianism, is based on the principles of non-aggression against non-aggressors, uh, private property through homesteading, with the result that only voluntary consensual acts between adults uh, would be legitimate, or certainly those all, all acts between uh, consenting adults would be legitimate. So I think it's a much more robust way to defend this philosophy, to defend the characters that are exemplified in defending the undefendable than the merchant or the employer or the grocer or the investor or the state kinds of people that Adam Smith defends. Let me read you a list of the chapters in defending the undefendable, which, and as I read them, I would ask you to realize that what they have in common is that not a one of them is guilty of the initiation of coercion. The list goes as follows. The prostitute, the pimp, the male chauvinist pig, the drug pusher, the drug addict, the blackmailer, the slanderer, the libeler, the denier of academic freedom, the advertiser, the person who yells fire in a crowded theater, the gypsy cab driver, the ticket scalper, the dishonest cop, the non-government counterfeiter, the miser, the inheritor, the money lender, the non-contributor to charity, a favorite of mine, the curmudgeon, the slumlord, the ghetto merchant, the speculator, the importer, the middleman, the profiteer, the strip miner, the litterer, the waste maker, the fat capitalist pig employer, the scab, the rate buster, and the employer of child labor. I think that when we look over this list of characters, we must conclude that none of them should be jailed or sanctions placed against them, violent sanctions, because they are not guilty themselves of the initiation of force. But more, it's heroic what they do that they continue to do this in the face of outlawry and uh, pretty much universal revulsion and scorn. Uh, it's not that there's anything intrinsic to what they do, it's just because of the uh, illegality. For example, if it was suddenly made illegal to wear a blue tie, right now there's nothing heroic about wearing a blue tie. But if a law were passed saying that blue ties uh, should not be worn and if you wear them you're subject to jail or a fine or what have you, then all of a sudden wearing a blue tie would become heroic in much the same way as are the activities of the people that I'm defending. There's nothing saintly about these activities. There's nothing necessarily good about them. One need not indulge or favor these things. Uh, let me just read a paragraph from the intro, intro, introduction to the book, and it says, the defense of such as the prostitute, pornographer, etc., is thus a very limited one. It consists solely of the claim that they do not initiate physical violence against non-aggressors. Hence, according to libertarian principles, none should be visited upon them. This means only that these activities should not be punished by jail sentences or other forms of violence. It decidedly does not mean that these activities are moral, proper, or good. So the libertarian defense of these things is, as I've said, it's, there's nothing intrinsically good. One need not indulge in order to be a libertarian. 
What I'd like to do is to discuss one or two chapters of the book, and then to discuss a few other issues that seem to me to be of relevance to sex, as discussed by libertarians. The first one I want to discuss with you is the pimp. And the book is illustrated by these cartoons. And what it says in the caption, if you can't see it, it says, look, I'm, uh, there, there are two men. One, a shorter man is sort of remonstrating with a taller man. And the shorter man says, look, I'm her father. I'm only interested in her welfare. But she won't listen to me. Please, talk to her. Tell her to come home with me to Akron. She'll listen to you. You're her pimp. <laughs> well, maybe it's funny seeing it than hearing me read it. <laughs> Do pimps engage in violence? Yes, the answer we must admit is that it's true. But there's nothing intrinsic to pimping that uh, needs engaging in violence. By the way, the only lowlifes not defending in defending the undefendable are ones who do initiate in initiatory violence or violations of property rights, and hence are incompatible with the non-aggression principle, such as the murderer, the trespasser, the pickpocket, the thief, the fraud, the kidnapper, the arsonist, etc. Pimps do, but not, it's not intrinsic to pimping to do this. For example, um, plumbers, bakers, garbage men all engage in violence as well, and yet they do not do so on an intrinsic basis. One could be a pimp without engaging in violence. One could uh, be a plumber without engaging in violence. I think the reason that the pimp engages in so much violence is because prostitution and pimping is illegal. We now have that movie, uh, uh, the one where Elliot Ness is chasing the bad guys and all. What's that movie called? The Untouchables. The Untouchables, right. Well, in those days when alcohol was prohibited, uh, uh, distillers and, and people that made alcoholic beverages did engage in violence. But it would be a mistake to think that there was anything intrinsic uh, in the production of these commodities and violence. Now, happily, they're uh, legal and there is no violence. There, there is no uh, uh, shooting in the streets uh, connected with uh, the production of alcohol. And so is, it in, uh, so is it the case in Nevada and Denmark, where prostitution is legal. There is no particular violence associated with it. So it all comes from the prohibition and not from the thing itself. What the pimp does economically is serves as an agent, like a real estate agent, bringing customers and uh, producers of a service together at a cost that's cheaper than they could do without the services of the intermediator. So economically, it's a very viable uh, kind of a situation. Uh, the other topics that I thought it appropriate to discuss uh, in the present venue are uh, Three. One is discrimination, secondly AIDS, and third, the differences between libertarians and others on their sexual practices. I'll leave that one, a very interesting one, to the last. On discrimination, I want to make a very few brief comments on this. First of all, I don't believe that the wage gap is due to discrimination. Now, the male-female wage gap is figured some 40%. This is based on the fact that women earn some 60% as much as men. And on the basis of this, uh, a great public policy has been erected. People think that it's the employer's discrimination practices, and we've got equal pay for work of equal value, and equal pay for equal work, and all sorts of other government interferences based on this. And the fact of the matter is that this is completely erroneous. Well, how can I say this if the, the plain fact is that women earn 60% as much as men? The reason for it is not discrimination, it's rather because of the institution of marriage. The institution of marriage has asymmetrical effects on male and female incomes. It enhances male incomes and reduces female incomes. The reasons for this is not too difficult to discern. Uh, women who are married or have been married or widowed, divorced, what have you, likely engaged in child rearing. And the more children they had, the lower their income is relative to married men. Uh, there's unequal child rearing, there's unequal uh, house care, there's unequal attachment to the labor force, there's unequal attachment to a particular job. For example, if a husband and wife equal, uh, equally 
able, equally productive, say they both have a PhD in chemistry or something like that, and one of them is offered a job in another city where the other one, the spouse, will just have to accept whatever is available in that city. Statistics show that they're much more likely to take this if it's the male that is offered the job and the female that just has to take whatever she can get than if it's the opposite. And the reason for this is very sensible because the, the husband and wife act like a firm which is trying to maximize the family's income. And you can do that more if you enhance the income of the male not the female, given that the female might take work, time out or years out for uh, child care or what have you. If these statistics were all that, it, that mattered, uh, we'd come up with some very strange kinds of anomalies. For example, uh, the same wage gap that exists between females and males also exists between married males and never married males. Namely, never married males earn some 60% as much as married males. And the reason is that the never married males don't have an assistant or a, a cooperator at home working with them. The main reason for the gap is because of the fact that married women who have ever been married, their incomes plummet and married men rise. The interesting statistic that we've done in, in two Fraser Institute books is we compared the never married male with the never married female. And my colleague Mike Walker and I are in competition with Walter Williams and Thomas Sowell to come up with the highest ratio for never married females compared to never married males. The, the average is about 1.0, namely that never married men and never married women earn virtually identical given the same number of school years or whatever preparation you're, you're controlling for. But if you take specific cases, like uh, people with PhDs, we've come up with a uh, ratio of 1.13, which shows that never married females earn 13% more than never married males. So I suppose we should have laws going the opposite way. Okay, that's the, that's the statistical argument. Now take the logical argument, the, the argument from economic logic. Let's suppose that it really were true that uh, employer discrimination were responsible for this 60% uh, wage rate. Well, may, let's make the following assumptions. That the productivity of a man and the productivity of a woman are the same, $10 per hour, for example. And that the man is making $10 an hour, but, true to our example, the woman is only making $6 an hour, hence the 60% wage ratio. Well, if you were the employer and you had two applicants in front of you equally productive, one of whom you could pay $10 and one of whom you could only pay $6, which one would you pick? Well, if you were a male chauvinist pig exploiting employer, etc., you might take the man. Someone else might take the woman. If they took the woman, it, it's as if there was a little sign on her forehead saying, hire me and you can make an extra $4 an hour profit. Do you see? So even if the male chauvinist pig employer hired the man under these crazy conditions, he would soon be driven out of business by uh, the competitor who hired women. Now, I'm not saying that discrimination is illegitimate and uh, inappropriate. I think in a free society, as long as you do not initiate coercion against anyone, you have the right to discriminate on whatever basis you want. I'm only saying that the economic evidence indicates that the reason for the male-female pay gap is not discrimination. It's this um, asymmetrical effects of marriage. But people do have a right to discriminate based on the libertarian uh, ethical code. And I'm very happy that, uh, to read that, uh, I read it in the Seattle paper actually, that the libertarian party has added a new plank that people can discriminate on yet another ground, namely AIDS, which is my second topic. I think it's very interesting to compare libertarians on the one hand with conservatives on, on the right, I guess that's your right, and, and liberals on the left. Uh, libertarians, well first of all, what the conservatives are, are calling for is quarantine, which is jailing people who are really innocent of, of initiating any coercion. Or Buckley was talking about tattooing people if they had AIDS, and he put a little tattoo. It's very reminiscent of the Star of David. Uh, which has got very negative connotations as far as I'm concerned. The liberals, on the other hand, just the opposite side, pretty much saying, well, you know, discrimination is such an evil that, that we can't even discriminate against AIDS carriers, even in sex. Uh, there was this case of uh, some dating service that wanted to have the requirement that before you uh, got on their list, you had to take the uh, blood test. And this was seen as, you know, discrimination against human rights and all that nonsense. Well, obviously, the libertarians are the moderates here. 
<laughs> we're, we're in the middle of the road. We're, we're not for coercing people, nor are we for preventing people from acting in a sensible way so that the whole human race doesn't die. I mean, it's not much of a choice here, you know, death on the one hand and coercion on the other side. I think we represent a moderate, reasonable, uh, middle of the road, uh, you know, I hate to be a moderate and all, but what the hell. I've been accused of lots of things, but never moderation. So I think we stand in much better uh, stead than uh, our opponents on either side of the, of the political spectrum. Now let me uh, come to the uh, question or answer to the question that you've all been waiting for with bated breath, namely how do libertarians differ from others on the question of sexual practices? And what I've done is I've compiled a long list with uh, help from some of my friends, uh, Michael Edelstein, Joe Cobb, Paula Brookmeyer, and Paul Geddes have been gathering these uh, instances for me. First, I'll, I'll indicate the sexual practices of everyone else, and then I'll indicate the libertarian sexual practices. Uh, this is sort of reminiscent of those bumper stickers that people see around. Objectivists do it on principle. <laughs> Bomb disposers do it carefully. <laughs> Oil refiners do it smoothly. Nurses and doctors do it with patience. <laughs> Musicians do it with rhythm. Rulers do it straight. <laughs> Plumbers do it with no leaks. <laughs> Divers do it deeper. Pilots do it higher. Politicians do it to everyone. <laughs> that is, except for libertarian politicians. Firemen do it in heat. Babies do it in a diaper. Astronomers do it in a black hole. Geolo geologists do it on the rocks. F sorry, I can't win them all, but... Uh, Freudians do it on the couch. Philosophers do it theoretically. <laughs> Teachers do it with class. Ministers do it prayerfully. Religious people do it faithfully. Ballet dancers do it in the air. Bankers do it with interest, with a penalty for early withdrawal. <laughs> Economists do it on demand. <laughs> Chefs do it spicily. Artists do it colorfully. Marathoners do it tiredly. Tennis players do it lovingly. Statists do it involuntarily. <laughs> Russell Means does it meaningfully. <laughs> Ron Paul does it appallingly well. <laughs> Golfers do it in the hole. Addicts do it compulsively. Attorneys do it advisedly. Judges do it judiciously. Little kids do it very little. <laughs> and now, <laughs> I'll have to add that here. <laughs> oh, well, I'll have to see this gentleman afterward. <laughs> and last but not least, libertarians do it voluntarily. <laughs> now, we can have fun, we can have a good time on this subject, but I would like to close with a very uh, more somber note. Uh, had it not been for our friend's big brother and his gang, there is another person who would have been on this panel. Her name is Norma Jean Almodovar, who is now in jail for no more than engaging in voluntary activities between consenting adults. So I hope that it will not be taken amiss if we end with a moment of silence to remember Norma Jean, who is not with us. Thank you very much. I'm glad that moment of silence was just for somebody who was in jail. It was a moment of silence for somebody who just died. That's the worst possible thing to follow. Uh, Lenny Bruce even used to have a routine about that, about a comedian who has to go on after Georgia Gibbs at the London Palladium. 
And Georgia Gibbs ends up by asking for a moment of silence for all those who lost their lives in the Battle of Britain. <laughs> Can you imagine what it's like to be a comedian following that? <laughs> Uh, last night, I uh, spoke a little bit about the evolutionary value of stupidity. <laughs> and I suppose some of you are at that, so I don't want to repeat too much of it. My argument was that stupidity has been around so long, it must be serving some evolutionary function. <laughs> and uh, there's so much of it. Uh, as Voltaire said, the only way to begin to underst uh, understand what mathematicians mean by infinity is to consider the extent of human stupidity. <laughs> and you can certainly see that when you look at other political parties. Uh, the, uh, I, I would like to take up one particular example of stupidity, the banning of LSD research in 1966, when the government certainly uh, suddenly announced that uh, scientists were no longer allowed to investigate the effects of LSD on the human nervous system. Uh, this was because the government and its wisdom decided that this uh, type of scientific research was dangerous. Uh, this is the same government that has not yet decided that nuclear testing is bad for your health. <laughs> it makes you wonder about them. Now, this, this to me uh, was the outstanding example of stupidity in the 1960s, which were a decade full of conspicuous examples of stupidity in Washington. And, and yet, in retrospect, uh, 21 years later, it seems this was the best thing the government did in the 1960s. As, as far as I can see, it's the only good thing they did in the 1960s. I can't remember anything else they did that had any good effects. Uh, but the result of the ban on LSD research was the creation of the LSD black market, which made a lot of my friends a lot of money and uh, allowed them to learn the skills of underground entrepreneurship. Uh, but in addition to that economic uh, benefit, which it brought to uh, many people, some of whom I can even see in the audience here. Uh, in addition to that, it had tremendously beneficial effects scientifically. Uh, because uh, aside from Tim Leary, the, the leading LSD researchers uh, decided to go into other fields of research uh, when they were driven out of the area of research that interested them. Uh, Tim, of course, went on, he went on the lecture circuit and went around the country trying to persuade people that law was abominable and inquisitorial and restricted scientific freedom, uh, all of which was true, so they put him in jail. Uh, he got, he got, uh, some of you may not even remember, he got 37 years, he got a sentence of 37 years for alleged possession of one joint uh, in a state, California, where the normal penalty for that heinous crime was six months. Uh, the judge denounced Leary's scientific writings from the bench while passing sentence, which was why the Swiss government gave uh, Leary asylum as a political fugitive when he arrived there. And just to digress a moment, it's a funny story which some of you may not know. Uh, Tim invented the Leary Interpersonal Diagnostic Grid in 1957, which is the most widely used diagnostic test in American psychology today. And it's used by the California prison system. <laughs> and when, uh, when Tim arrived in the California prison system, or as he prefers to say, when the people of California rewarded him with several years of public support in which he could meditate and do further philosophical research since he couldn't do scientific research anymore. He, he felt it was very, very nice of the Californians to give him all these years at public expense to sit and meditate and think and get his ideas in order. But when he arrived there, they gave him the Leary Interpersonal Diagnostic Test, which he had invented. And uh, as some of you may know, this, this has 64,000 personality types in it, but they can basically be broken down to four major types. Um, friendly strength, friendly weakness, hostile weakness, and hostile strength. And uh, you can land, land anywhere in those four quadrants you uh, want if you understand the test. So Leary put himself down in friendly weakness, which is the uh, mama's boy in the cliche, the dependent neurotic, the person who needs guidance and needs to be told what to do and never makes any problems except asking for too much attention. Mommy, buy me that. And uh, so having put himself down as uh, friendly weakness, he got put in a minimum security prison. <laughs> and then he quickly climbed over a wall and went to Algiers. <laughs> and, uh, this, uh, the, 
there's a moral in this for everyone. If you're going to be a heretic, invent the test that the authorities are using <laughs> so you know how to find your way around them. Uh, since Tim got out of prison, he has uh, sagaciously applied himself to the development of computer software. He has one computer game on the market already, and he's bringing out another soon. And uh, so that was one of the benefits of banning LSD research. It took Tim longer than most to figure out how this country was being run, but he would probably never have gotten into computer software and wouldn't have come up with these fascinating games that teach you as much psychology as three or four years of psychotherapy would if they hadn't driven him out of the field of research he was interested in. And then there's the case of John Lilly. He was one of the foremost LSD researchers, and when the government drove him out of that, he started improving on the isolation tank. And the kind of flotation tank that's available in most American cities now, I bet Seattle has a place where you can rent flotation tanks, right? Yeah. Yeah, most large American cities do. And the kind of tanks that you can rent uh, the Lilly tanks that, uh, that Lilly improved on the original design. Lilly did more research on that tank than just about anybody. There's been more research done on them, and we know, for instance, once you get used to the tank, after you get over the stage of thinking, supposing I drown, will anybody hear me if I yell? And uh, God, it's dark in here, and gee, this is boring. When does the fun start? After, after you get past that, when you get used to the tank, uh, you, go, you very easily go into a Samadhi like state, very much like the LSD peak, in fact, even more like the ketamine trip. And in the tank, uh, you very easily get into this samadhi, which means that your brain waves go down to very low alpha, sometimes below alpha to theta. You get into deep relaxation and intense alertness, and when you come out of the tank, your brain is ready to learn at a tremendously accelerated rate, more than usual, which is why people who go into the tank every week find that for three or four days afterwards, they're much more creative than usual. Uh, the reason they're more creative is they are having rushes of endorphins through the brain. Endorphins are peptides, which means that they don't know whether they're neurotransmitters or hormones, so they run around the brain and the body both. Most neurotransmitters stay in the brain and most hormones stay in the body. Uh, endorphins being peptides run around the brain and the body both. And what they do is they make you susceptible to very rapid learning and very fast conceptualization. Um, I think if you put an objectivist in a flotation tank, even they would change their opinions on a few things. Uh, but I, wait a minute, I'm a libertarian. I'm not saying we should forcibly shove them in the tank. I, if they voluntarily would. Um, and uh, this tank is doing wonders for people. There are hundreds of thousands of people in the States and in Europe who are using these tanks regularly and becoming more creative conceptualizing better and faster, <coughs> developing new skills, and of course relaxing much more deeply than most people in Western, Europe, Western society ever have. And we wouldn't have had that if they hadn't driven Lilly out of the field of LSD research. And then there's the Graf breathing technique, which is being used at Esalen and a lot of places. Graf wouldn't have invented that if they hadn't driven him out of LSD research. He was Czechoslovakian, you know. Uh, he came to the United States because the LSD research he was doing in Czechoslovakia were leading him in non-Marxist directions of thought. And he felt it was getting increasingly unsafe to publish his scientific conclusions in a Marxist state. So he came to America looking for freedom. And then they passed a law telling him he couldn't do that kind of research here. And so he went into investigating yoga and breathing techniques and Reiki and breathing and so on. And now he's developed a spectacular breathing technique which is, uh, throws people into tremendously rapid uh, body and mind changes and growth experiences, and it's becoming uh, widely used uh, outside Esalen as well as at Esalen. And that was because they stopped this man from doing the kind of research he wanted. A lot of others went into biofeedback, and the effect of this in biofeedback in producing relaxation and alertness is very well documented by now. It's the second most popular treatment advised by doctors for that most American of all diseases, hypertension, high blood pressure. If you've got four friends with hypertension, the odds are that two of them are using biofeedback on the recommendation of their doctor. It's probably much safer than allopathic drugs, and it's getting more and more widely used. We, uh, and most of what we know about the brain, we've learned more about the brain in the last 21 years than in all previous history. That's a remark you see in practically any book on neuroscience that's come out in the last few years. The last two decades have been tremendously fruitful, and it's all because these people who were so happy doing acid research had their acid taken away from them, and they had to do something else to keep life interesting. 
So you see, stupidity does have a value. Uh, uh, sometimes it doesn't have a value for everybody. As far as I can make out, the main effect of alcohol prohibition was that the mafia grew from being a uh, small extortionist outfit in New York City and to becoming a nationwide uh, million dollar outfit controlling labor unions after they got out of the booze business. And uh, the main effect. Uh, the, the main effect of uh, pot uh, and heroin prohibition is that the mafia has graduated from multi-billionaires into billionaires and now they own their own banks. And in some parts of the world they own their own countries. Now that's not very good from my point of view, but from the point of view of the mafia it's very good. And so if I were in the mafia I would be doing every, everything I could to encourage more stupidity on the part of politicians. Stupidity always profits somebody. The uh, two, uh, two years ago, I came back from Ireland to do a lecture tour in America, and uh, some of my uh, most enthusiastic fans are psychiatrists and psychologists. And I started hearing every place I went from psychiatrists and psychologists about this marvelous new compound called MDMA. And they said, we're curing everything with it. It's incredible. It's everything we thought acid was before they made us stop that line of research. And I thought, gee, this is interesting. The government's not interfering with it. How can that be happening? Has, has something new happened in the United States government? And this went on all through that tour. People kept telling me, this MDMA, it's really great. We, we're getting the most astounding results. And I come back on my next tour and I found that it had been made illegal. <laughs> uh, so the government is uh, living up to its uh, reputation. And that, of course, has made fortunes for several young entrepreneurs who started manufacturing MDMA as soon as it was made illegal. So stupidity always profits somebody. Meanwhile, the people who are doing all the MDMA research have been forced into other areas of research, so new discoveries will be made. <coughs> and so stupidity is sort of an evolutionary driver. Uh, the, the Toynbee uh, theory of history is that you need challenge to get change. If the challenge is too great, people collapse under it and nothing happens. The society falls apart. If you get too little challenge, uh, no, no progress is made. So I think um, the stupidity of governments and large religious bodies probably has been one of the major evolutionary drivers of human history. Uh, well, without this, we'd probably all be sitting around in caves uh, trying to figure out whether 2 plus 2 equals 4 or 5. Uh, stupidity forces intelligent people to get more intelligent. The people driven out of LSD research made more basic discoveries about the brain uh, than ever were made before. And so I think uh, the Libertarian Party is a little bit too harsh on stupidity. We tend to want everybody to be as intelligent as Libertarians. Uh, that, that would put all the challenge out of life. That would, that would remove a, a great element of adventure. The. Um, I may overrate stupidity somewhat uh, because I was opposed to it all my life until recently I started thinking of its evolutionary functions. Back in 1977 in the Illuminati papers I had a chapter on the desirability of abolishing stupidity and I even had suggestions about who's, how stupidity could be abolished. And then I started taking this evolutionary relativist perspective and thinking stupidity must be doing something. But uh, there are, there's the other alternative. Perhaps what I attribute to stupidity has other motivations. I, I have been trying to figure out why we have the incredible body of laws we have telling us what we can do and what we can't do uh, uh, when uh, they are controlling things that are totally non-invasive, non-aggressive, and uh, nobody's damn business. And uh, I come back again to the point I made before. These, these laws are actually very profitable for a lot of people. They may not be entirely the result of stupidity. Maybe I'm attributing to stupidity what actually should be credited to low cunning and predation, <laughs> which are, as every Darwinian knows, are very valuable evolutionary traits. Hardly any species would survive without them. But it's certainly true that the Mafia did graduate from a small New York extortionist group to one of the most powerful multinational corporations in the world today. They've practically taken over the Vatican Bank, as we've discovered in recent exposés in Italy. That's why Archbishop Marcinkus only comes out of the Vatican on Groundhog's Day, and if he sees a policeman shadow, he ducks back in again. <laughs> and uh, 
a lot of a lot of uh, idealistic libertarians say if we could only get rid of stupidity, if we can only educate people, all these silly drug laws would be abolished. But is it just stupidity that we uh, that we are up against? It seems to me that when an organization like the Mafia is making not hundreds of millions, but according to reliable estimate, billions of dollars every year out of the cocaine trade, uh, they have a very heavy vested interest in keeping cocaine illegal. Uh, cocaine is one of the biggest businesses in the world today. Uh, show business, practically Hollywood runs on cocaine. Money is only resorted to for minor transactions. <laughs> uh, and, and a, lot, a lot of libertarians have urged alternative currency systems. But how many libertarians have noticed that cocaine has become the major alternative currency system of part of our economy? As DeLorean said in the famous film, it's better than gold. Uh, not that I, not, not that I, I really want to uh, come on like a, a cocaine advocate. Uh, the only good thing about cocaine is that it's nature's way of letting you know you've got too goddamn much money. <laughs> but uh, it, uh, where would the Vatican Bank today be today without the cocaine business? They, they might be bankrupt. Where would the CIA be without their share of the cocaine business? It seems most of the things that Congress doesn't know about are not financed by presidential channels to the CIA, but by their cocaine banks, like the one in Australia and the one down in Miami, the World Finance Corporation that got busted recently, and their share in the heroin trade and uh, the Golden Triangle and so on. So I don't think that it's a question of educating people about uh, why we need libertarian laws. It's a question that we are up against vested interests that have a tremendous uh, amount of uh, expectation. Uh, the, the Mafia, I'm sure, they have, uh, they, they, a lot of the people in the Mafia have been to Harvard Business School now. They know, they know how to do uh, computer forecasting and so on. And since they are now billionaires on the basis of these laws, I'm sure they expect that by around the year 2000, they'll be bigger than General Motors and DuPont combined. Uh, already, Bucky Fuller said in his last book, Grunch of Giants, the very last book Bucky wrote, he said the modern world is controlled by M.M. AO, which is his abbreviation for the Mafia, Machiavelli, Adams, and Oil. I think by the year 2000, it'll, uh, the Mafia will be the strongest of those four forces, and we all might as well learn Italian, so we know how to negotiate with the people who will be running the world. Uh, the, the only alternative I see to that is if an intelligence-raising product does appear on the market and people start figuring out what's going on and decide we don't want these silly laws that are making the Mafia rich, at the expense of uh, uh, throwing so many uh, of our most talented and creative people in jail every year because they prefer uh, different types of recreation than Ronald Reagan. And uh, I, I don't know what intelligence raising uh, instrument would do that. There are, uh, there are uh, some very interesting uh, machines around that actually teach you how to adjust your brain waves so you can get into those same states you get into in the Louis tank, and you can uh, therefore go through a process of rapid learning in the next week or so after you've used these machines. Perhaps if these machines come into general use, we will see an upsurge of public intelligence and people will decide our laws should not be written entirely to enrich the mafia. Uh, they should reflect the actual needs of the majority of us, and we don't need these silly laws. But until that happens, I expect these laws will stay on the books, the Mafia will get richer and richer every day, and uh, plausible people like Jerry Falwell and Ronald Reagan will say, well, we need these laws or otherwise the country would crumble into chaos. And it's even possible they believe it, that they're not being paid directly by the Mafia to say that. And as I said, stupidity is the most powerful force on this planet. And so I am... Uh, I am... Uh, like all other libertarians, I am totally opposed to these idiotic laws controlling what ways people use to get high, but I don't expect to see them change in the near future unless there is first an intelligence raising technology on the market. Maybe that technology is beginning to emerge. I would like to think so. In the meanwhile, I expect that, as Ambrose Beer said, the idiots are the largest part of the population and therefore ultimately, ultimately they will control everything. Thank you. Before I begin, a little theme music, if I may. Figure out if this thing works here. Six, 
in Seattle. <laughs> For those of you who haven't heard the Dr. Demento show, it's basically a program of comedy and novelty recordings by people like Spike Jones, Tom Lehrer, Stan Freeberg, Monty Python, Frank Zappa, and some newer artists in the same vein, such as uh, Weird Al Yankovic, who uh, I was the guy who discovered him, and oh, thank you. Barnes and Barnes. The Frantics. Uh, it's still a lively field, though it's been driven underground by the general indifference of the American record industry to this sort of entertainment. But anybody who works with humorous material sooner or later comes across material that is likely to offend someone's sensibilities, and I am certainly no exception. While I would not consider the Dr. Demento show to be a true example of the phenomenon called shock radio that has been written up in time and it's the kind of thing you might hear from Howard Stern in New York or Philadelphia or the Grease Man in Washington, D.C., uh, people have on occasion gotten themselves severely bent out of shape by things that I've played. And so I've had 16 years of experience now in discovering what I can and cannot get away with over the commercial network radio in America today. Actually, uh, truth to tell, I never play dirty records on my show because I, I always um, carefully use the disc washer and clean each one. <laughs> so no dirty records on my show. Back in the 70s, I used to give a lecture on college campuses called uh, Songs I Can't Play on the Dr. Demento Show. What this basically was, was a history of pornography on records. Records are perhaps not the ideal medium for pornography, but there has been quite a bit of it over the years anyway. I used to start the lecture with this little song by uh, Donovan. I was impressed like everyone when man began to fly Out of earthly regions to planets in the sky with total media coverage, we watched the heroes land As ceremoniously they disturbed the cosmic sand In awe with admiration, we listened to the talk Such pride felt they, such joy to be upon the moon to walk My romantic vision shattered when it was explained to me Spacemen wear old diapers in which they should be how the intergalactic laxative will get you from here to there Relieve you and believe me without to worry or care If shitting is your problem when you're out there in the stars How the intergalactic laxative will get you from here to Mars Now that's about as innocent a little song as you could ask for <laughs> it has plenty of socially redeeming qualities It's highly educational uh, If I had a small child I wouldn't hesitate a moment to play it for him or her uh, not that it hasn't been heard a time or two on local stations, especially non-commercial college stations, but no way could I get away with that on a commercial network. How does one decide what is permissible and what is not? Well, for the first 30 years of commercial radio up until the 50s, it was pretty simple. If there was any doubt, it was taboo. But because like other American mass media in the 30s and 40s, radio was quite circumspect. and. Uh, People who were in radio for the long haul just, it hardly, I think, ever even seriously occurred to them to do anything in the way of anything more than the absolute very mildest form of innuendo, never mind the four-letter words. Watching over everything was the Federal Communications Commission, which was formed in 1934 uh, as the successor to the Federal Radio Commission. Uh, this agency's primary task was to keep the radio stations from interfering with each other. Fair enough. Uh, make sure each one had its own frequency or channel and didn't impinge on anybody else's. When the FCC went a little bit beyond that and issued a few regulations that essentially said, uh, thou shalt not say or play anything obscene over the public airwaves, there wasn't much protest at that time because it just didn't occur to many people 
than it should be otherwise. I mean, at that time, the movies had the Hayes Code, and uh, there were certainly lots of restrictions on what sort of printed material could be sent through the public mails, and there were some people who objected, certainly, but uh, most people in the business of mass media simply accepted that that was the way the American people wanted it. Uh, well, it did occur to a few that it should be otherwise. Uh, in the early 1940s, uh, some people who worked for a company called Standard Radio Transcriptions, which provided a lot of programming to major American radio stations and a lot of minor stations too at that time, decided to press up records of this little song and send it out, not for airplay, mind you, but strictly as a Christmas gift to their customers. College Radio, which was in 1959, uh, Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I was under the impression that somewhere in the very restricted range of our transmitter was a blue-haired lady that was paid by the FCC to uh, monitor every word and would have me thrown in the dungeon for the slightest misstep. Uh, of course, it wasn't quite that way, though it might as well have been in the 50s for all the transgressions that went on in that decade in our business, but in the 60s things got a little looser as they did in other mass media. The people who pioneered the so-called underground freeform FM commercial stations in the late 60s, uh, fondly remembered stations like KMPX in San Francisco and uh, KPPC in Los Angeles, uh, they started exploring the boundaries of what they could get away with and uh, they were I think rather pleasantly surprised that they were able to play some of the more free-spirited music of that time without interference from Washington. Uh, most of the FCC actions concerning radio station content that I recall from this period had to do with such things as phony contests, uh, stations announcing there would be a million dollar first prize and having no intention of ever awarding it. I do remember a couple stations getting called on the carpet for promulgating racism, the kind of thing that uh, certainly does try the patience of many defenders of the First Amendment uh, and would fall into the classification maybe of defending the undefendable. But when I began uh, doing my show on KPPC in 1970, I was told I could play just about anything I pleased. Uh, now, I was originally hired to play rock and roll oldies, by the way, but I quickly found it was rock and roll novelty songs that got the biggest response from my listeners. Transfusion, the Purple People Eater, things like that. So I moved uh, onward to other non-rock and roll comedy and novelty material like Spike Jones and Alan Sherman, and I took advantage of my freedom from interference to play a lot of things from earlier times that would have been just about unthinkable on the airwaves at the time they were recorded, going from the great satiric songs that uh, Tom Lehrer did in the 50s, things like the old dope peddler or the Vatican rag, uh, to such artists as Ruth Wallace, uh, Larry Vincent, and Rusty Warren, who made what were called party records in the 40s and 50s, uh, entertainment that's somewhere between sophisticated cabaret singing and softcore audio pornography. 
I even rediscovered one of the great closet classics of recorded history, the farting contest uh, between Lord, uh, Paul Boomer and Lord Windesmere. That sold it. That that recording sold well tens of thousands of copies anyway uh, under the counter in the downtown novelty shops of the 1940s, and I rediscovered it to, in the 70s and played it on the air several times, though I was careful to edit out the word fart, so it wasn't too obvious just what they were doing, at least obvious to stupid people. <laughs> Not once through all this did I feel the heavy hand of the FCC on my shoulder. Eventually, though, I did have to, so to speak, clean up my act. Because after a couple of years on the air in Los Angeles, I started getting what were considered to be remarkably good ratings, and people realized that there might be a market for the Dr. Demento show in national syndication. Uh, I should mention in passing that it was a station here in Seattle that was the very first customer for the syndicated show, so I owe this beautiful city a measure of debt. But anyhow, within a few months, the company that took me on had placed my show on over 100 uh, stations in such cities as New York, Chicago, Detroit, and Boston. Uh, those ratings in Los Angeles looked pretty impressive, even if the content of the show was sometimes hard for some people in the business to swallow. We found out pretty quickly, as it happened, that some, some things that went over very well in uh, Los Angeles on the Freeform Underground Station were a little hard for station executives to handle in other parts of the country, uh, especially after the farting contest was aired for the first and the last only time on the network edition of the show. When we asked them what the problem was, well, it turned out that it was not that they were afraid of the FCC. We hardly ever heard that. Sometimes they'd say, they were more likely to say something like, well, this is a very conservative city, or uh, we have a very strong Christian influence here, you see. But uh, most often it was that they were concerned about what their commercial sponsors might think of the material. I recall we lost a station in Wichita when a local auto dealer heard Tom Lehrer's Vatican rag on my show and was so outraged he pulled all his advertising off the whole station. So, so since the Wichitas of the world are very important to a syndication company, well, we compromise a little bit. I've often had the opportunity, in fact, to make use of my skills in tape editing. You're breaking my heart. You're tearing it apart so fast. network edition of the Dr. Demento show, you see and hear a classic example of something in the mass media that has evolved to a certain place solely by the demands of the commercial marketplace, without at least any visible interference from uh, Washington. Something that was born as a strictly countercultural phenomenon has evolved into something that's very successful in the mainstream in places like Jackson, Mississippi and Salt Lake City, Utah. and. Uh, enjoys the long-standing patronage of a fairly conservative uh, national corporation, the Warner Lambert Corporation, which makes uh, chewing gum and uh, dentine and chic razors and things like that. Now, I do miss playing the farting contest, which really does strike me as being pretty harmless in the scheme of things. Uh, and I miss a little more playing things like the Vatican rag. Uh, we do get away with both of those, still a little bit on the station in Los Angeles, uh, where where I know the manager very well and just how far I can push him. But the marketplace is getting what it wants to pay for, and as a libertarian, that's fine by me. As much as I savor some things that are heard on non-commercial radio, and envy a little, uh, I envy a little bit of their freedom to perhaps go a little farther than I can in certain areas of social satire, I do want to do something that pays its own way so I can live on profit and not on a handout something to do with, I guess, the same thinking that uh, drew me to this party. Now, Howard Stern has evolved to a rather different place. Uh, he does great in New York City, though uh, what he does doesn't work too well uh, in places like Wichita, where his national syndicated show didn't work at all, but he does fantastically in New York, and I envy him, but uh, I've evolved to my own place strictly by the marketplace, and that's fine with me. 
Now, while all this was going on, while the Dr. Demento show was growing and prospering, the FCC, along with many other judicial and regulatory agencies, was wringing its hands and gnashing its teeth, trying to define obscenity. In 1975, the FCC proclaimed that George Carlin's comedy routine called The Seven Words You Can Never Say on Television could not be said on the radio either, at least, uh, <laughs> at least not on a station run by the Pacifica Foundation, which owns KPFK and uh, Plus KPFK in LA, KPFA in Berkeley, and several other stations, uh, and their politics have never endeared themselves to Republican officials. Well, that's where it stood until this spring when the FCC uh, rattled its sabers or shook its finger, nanny, 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 or something like that. Nobody's quite sure what. But anyway, they singled out for condemnation three entities from the whole universe of American radio. One being Howard Stern, the most visible proponent of so-called shock radio. Once again, the FCC's old whipping boy, the Pacifica Foundation, and also a little college station in Santa Barbara, California. Now, Howard Stern may be the foulest mouth on the airwaves. He spouts sexism and racism and has no concept of tact or taste, and he may be indeed one of the uh, undefendables, but he is extremely popular to judge by the ratings, and as far as I'm concerned, if a couple million people want to listen to him regularly when there are dozens of other things they could be listening to, those couple of million people should not be denied their right to hear Howard Stern just because a few thought control types find him to be a little bit out of control. Uh, the Pacifica station, KPFK, got zapped for some graphic language in a play about AIDS. So it's not pleasant stuff, but then AIDS isn't very pleasant stuff either. As for the Santa Barbara station, the FCC appears to have been persuaded to take action by one particularly zealous local citizen, a non-student of the university, but one who happens to be convinced that he should be controlling what is aired on the campus radio station. Everyone in my end of the radio biz is waiting kind of anxiously for the FCC's next move. Uh, when they made their George Carlin decision in 75, I didn't like it, but uh, it didn't affect me much because the marketplace had already made much the same decision regarding the content of my show. There are just not very many commercial stations who want to air a program that says fuck on the radio. But there have been many ominous rumblings that they may want to go far beyond the so-called Carlin decision. Uh, uh, the phrasing that's sometimes used is that they want to go after not just obscenity, but also indecency, and if they can't define obscenity, how the heck are they going to ever define indecency? I wonder if the real issue isn't simply control, uh, who owns the airwaves. The good commissioners have seen fit to cast off a lot of unnecessary rules and regulations affecting everything from multiple station ownership to how often you have to say, uh, this is KJET in Seattle. And uh, I was gratified to see them greatly relax the requirements for getting a license to operate a radio station's console and transmitter so that I didn't have to know uh, two years' worth of bonehead physics in order to open up a microphone, as you used to have to. So uh, why don't they just be consistent and leave the content alone and let the people choose uh, what they want to listen to? Do I have time to leave you with a brief song? Oh, okay. I have a sad story to tell you It may hurt your feelings a bit Last night when I went into my bathroom I stepped in a big pile of shaving cream Be nice and clean Shave every day and you'll always look keen Here we are on the big airplane I hate to be picking a nit, but the ads all promised me great gourmet food, and you brought me a plate full of shaving cream. Be nice and clean, shave every day, and you'll always look keen. Here we are in this nuclear power plant. I don't really know how to run it, I'll admit. Oh gosh, looks like I pushed the wrong button. Now half of Oregon is all shot to shaving cream. Be nice and clean, shave every day and you'll always look keen. The FCC likes deregulation, which is okay by me, I'll admit. 
But bureaucrats are addicted to power and they've got to find some way, some way to keep giving us shaving cream. Be nice and clean. Shave every day and you'll always look keen. I am fed up with conventional politicians. On Republicans and Democrats I spent. They promise you peace and prosperity. And what do they give you? Shave and cream. Be nice and clean. Shave every day and you'll always look clean. Thank you. Don't forget to stay in. to uh, thank the three doctors for providing some interesting insights on these three topics of uh, importance to us. And now I'd like to uh, take the rest of the time here to allow you to ask them uh, questions. You can direct them to anyone you, you care to. Yes, sir, in the back. That's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, as a matter of fact, I didn't, uh, I've never heard before that Croft gave it to top communist officials and that it had that effect, so uh, I really can't comment on that. Uh, the, um, it certainly is true that uh, in scientific research, uh, LSD had uh, numerous beneficial effects, uh, very statistically very high uh, rate of cure of alcoholism, uh, astounding cures of childhood schizophrenia or autism, a very intractable disease. Um, Leary's research on convicts produced an astounding effect. 90% of his convicts uh, became non-repeaters, whereas 90% of most convicts are convicted again within a year after release. Leary's convicts hadn't committed any new crimes. Uh, Twelve years after his research with them, uh, Walter Houston Clark hunted up as many of them as could be found in 1973, and they were still non-criminals. Uh, the, the effects in, uh, with proper scientific controls were truly astounding, and uh, that's why Leary and many others thought it was the most beneficial compound ever discovered in the history of psychiatry. Uh, it's, it's main, uh, the, the, the main bad effects are that it induces disorientation, anxiety, and paranoia in government officials who've never tried it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, sometimes in other in immature minds, uh, people under 20 and uh, those are otherwise on the same mental level as politicians. Yes, sir. Uh, the uh, Michael Hutchison's book, Megabrain, has the latest data on the effects of isolation tanks. And there have been several studies that show that after you've been in an isolation tank, uh, you, are, you are much more likely to have creative breakthroughs in the next two or three days. You learn things much faster. You can absorb information and organize it in novel and original ways, which is the definition of creativity. It's very much like LSD in that sense. It frees up. It breaks down the habitual networks in the brain, and you start forming new networks. Uh, that's because it uh, leads to the production of peptides, uh, apparently, when you get into the deep alpha and theta states while in the isolation tank. Uh, Michael Hutchison's book, which I just mentioned, I'm going to mention it again because it's the best book on recent neuroscience. It's called Mega Brain. And it's not often you get a writer standing in front of you recommending a book by somebody else. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
Uh, I'm sorry, Mom, I couldn't hear the question. Uh, yes, I've, I've read about him in the radio trades, but uh, I certainly applaud his efforts. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, I'm back. I think what's upsetting, well, in terms of the fairness doctrine, what one would in a logical world, one would expect that since they seem to have loosened up on radio in most other ways, that they would also loosen up in the terms of uh, content, the indecency and obscenity business. But I mean the the pronouncements of last spring, of those three stations being uh, singled out for obscenity and, de and indecency would not lead you to believe that way. I think what upsets many people in radio so much about what's happened this year is just that nobody seems to know which way they're going to go. Pardon me? Well, the, the, the little changes are being made all the time, like uh, for instance, recently it was decided that a given entity could own more stations than they could previously. So there is a fair amount of loosening up in that department. And we know what happened to the Fairness Doctrine, but uh, they've been inconsistent. That's what bothers me. I, I think that they must be responding to visible public pressure from people with uh, Reaganist uh, views of the social agenda. That's the only way I can figure it out. Must be at least one question on sex out here. You ma'am, how about you? It's about rock and roll. When they had so much trouble with money to get into the Rolling Stones, I can't get no satisfaction songs like that on radio years ago. No one said anything about labeling and grading records. Now they've got prints with this Gee, uh, once again, I hesitate to predict uh, which way that uh, that thing is going to turn out. It's really another issue, another whole can of worms. Uh, as a broadcaster, I never mind. In fact, I was always a little thankful if uh, when comedy records, as they have for many years, would often come with indications as to how broadcastable the material might be. But on the other hand, when I realized that if records are rated as movies are, that that will restrict the access of certain younger members of the population to certain important records, that that doesn't, uh, that hardly squares with my libertarian ideals. So it's hard to, I mean, that, that's a tough question. That is a tough call because uh, one also perhaps uh, has to think of the rights of parents, but then the parents really should be responsible enough to uh, to educate their kids themselves and, and not be worried that a, a simple phonograph record might lead them down the path to uh, death and destruction. Yes, sir. Dr. Demento, uh, there's a station in Chicago, a very interesting classical station, that has a show called uh, Midnight Special. Uh, and the classical music is very good. Uh, and they have a Have you had any luck personally talking to people of that kind of mindset? 
Well, I, I don't really get too political on my show because I was hired to do entertainment. I, I'm sure my libertarian ideas leak out now and then by osmosis of nothing else, and now and then I'll, I'll say something pointedly like that. But I, I don't see the Dr. Demento show as promulgating a, a message, a social agenda. I actually, I guess, you know, on a personal level, when you talk to your boss or when you're just talking to other colleagues in the profession. Oh, uh, what, what do you mean, pardon me? Uh, as far as persuading them that uh, free market ideas are, are reasonable or libertarian ideas, well, no, I haven't really sat down and discussed libertarian philosophy with my boss at, at, at the station in Los Angeles. Uh, I know the guy who runs the network is, is a Democrat who funds democratic politics fairly heavily. But, uh, I, I, he certainly has uh, profited largely by his own entrepreneurship. I guess he considers that he's profited by his smarts and his salesmanship. And he's, he hires me just to provide two hours of entertainment that will bring in the bucks. First of all, I, I recommend you buy another copy of the first one. <laughs> uh, actually, I am uh, in the process of writing two sequels. One is uh, I've written four or five articles in the Journal of Libertarian Studies on privatizing roads and highways and streets and sidewalks. And the working title for the book, which will comprise all of those articles, is Privatizing the Unprivatizable. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a certain elan. Uh, I do have uh, enough material for about three or four more uh, in the vein of Defending the Undefendable, and I think the, the working title there is Defending the Undefendable 2 or Son of, Unde <laughs> Son of Undefendable or something like that. Yes, I am working on uh, material, and I plan to publish something else. Thank you. Yes, sir. Follow-up. Well, yes, there are numerous institutions and people, I suppose. Well, let's not get into people, but certainly institutions or activities that really are undefendable from a libertarian point of view, such as rape, murder, trespass, theft, IRS. Uh, IRS. There, there are lots of things that, that are undefendable for, from a libertarian perspective, namely anyone who initiates coercion against the non-aggressor. The, uh, what the defending the undefendable book one, two, three, or N uh, have in common is that what they defend is activities, however hated by some people, which do not intrinsically initiate coercion against uh, non-aggressors. So th there is, and I think that's what the Libertarian Party is dedicated against, namely opposing that which really is undefendable from a Libertarian point of view. Yes, sir. Yes, um, the, the non-government counterfeiter. Um, this is the one that, that creates the most trouble for me in libertarian audiences. I think it's, it's the only one that creates any trouble. Maybe blackmail and libel, some people uh, get a little snarky about that, but usually I can win them over very quickly. But I've been uh, waging an uphill battle on this. Uh, even people I respect and admire uh, don't agree with this. And, that hasn't stopped me from believing it yet, but maybe one day I'll, I'll see the error of my ways. But until I do, my view is that counterfeiting is no good if what you're counterfeiting is legitimate money. But if what you're counterfeiting is itself counterfeit, i.e. US currency, then we have to look at that very differently. It's sort of like stealing from a thief. In other words, if, if I take um, uh, Dr. Wilson's watch, and, and he is the legitimate owner of that watch, well, that's clear theft and it's undefendable. But if suppose he stole it from someone else, and I take it, well, then I think we have to look at that very differently than we look at legitimate private property. Uh, for example, I remember when Ayn Rand did her analysis of cashing in the student rebellion uh, she was uh, vitriolic and very unhappy with the student protesters who were taking over Berkeley and Columbia and other universities. 
Uh, Berkeley is a public university, i.e. it is built with stolen funds. Therefore, the people that are seizing it are, whatever they're doing, they're not stealing. They're liberating, they're uh, transferring, wh whatever you want to call it. Redistributing. Redistributing, uh, whatever, uh, whatever you want to call it. But it's not stealing, because stealing, I think, from a libertarian perspective, should only be applied to taking rightfully owned property from the rightful owner. Well, so is it with counterfeiting. If we had a gold standard and we had legitimate money, anyone who tried to counterfeit that would be illegitimate. But the chapter I defend in, in Defending the Undefendable is... Uh, counterfeiting counterfeit money. And I think it's a very different analysis. Yes, well, l let me just say that again, see if I've got you. If, if someone takes money from someone else, let's say Mr. B steals money from Mr. A, and Mr. C comes along and takes it from Mr. B, he's got an obligation to give it to Mr. A. Well, the problem with that from a libertarian perspective is that uh, another um, predication or another building block of our philosophy is that there are no positive obligations whatsoever. The only obligation that we have is to keep our mitts in our own pockets and not to aggress. So, if I'm Mr. C, and, and let's say I take the, the watch from Dr. Wilson, who really took it from someone else, uh, okay, they say Dr. Demento, it was really Dr. Demento's watch. Dr. Wilson took it from him, he's the thief, and now I took it from Dr. Wilson and I've got it. Well, I think Why that am it I would... getting typecast as the thief? Well, with that accent. <laughs> <I> mean... <laughs> Uh, now I've got the watch. So I, I, the way I analyze it would be it would be over and above the call of duty. I would be a nice guy if I just came and gave him the watch. Secondarily, if he came to me and said, hey, Walter, by the way, uh, that watch there, that's mine. If I resisted him and said, well, I'm sorry, I'm not giving it back to you, I would be doing something wrong. I think, however, that uh, at least based on the analog of the law of the sea merchant, uh, what we've got here is a bit of salvage. Do you say, uh, like, the law of the sea merchant is the libertarian law, as far as I'm concerned, that what occurs in, in the world of anarchy, namely the high seas, and what they've evolved there is that, that if you salvage a boat, you are credited with one-third of it. So I think I could demand of him as a matter of right that he give me one-third the value of the watch and turn over the, the rest of the watch to him. But suppose he doesn't come to me. Do I have the positive obligation to go and find him? An interesting case came up in Out the Shrug, where Ragnar Danishkold was doing similar kinds of things. For those of you perverts who haven't read Out the Shrug, I'm sure there are very few here, uh, Ragnar Danishkold was a Randian hero who went around liberating gold from the people's ships or from the government ships that were sending to the people's republics of here, there, and everywhere. And what he would do is he would seize gold and then give it to people like Reardon from whom it had been stolen. See, in my view, what, what Ragnar did, or what I did with the watch, is really two things, if I give it back to Dr. Demento. On the one hand, I take it from the thief, or Ragnar takes it from the thieves, and secondarily, he gives it back to the honest men. He does two separate acts. Now, everyone here is, is willing to concede, or will happily agree with the, the statement that the, the sum total of the two acts, or the big act, namely taking it from one, the illegitimate, person or the thief and giving it back to the victim is appropriate. I contend if both acts or the gigantic act is correct, then each one must be correct because two wrongs don't make a right. You can't have a wrong and then something else overrides it. If, if the double act is correct, then each constituent element must, must be legitimate on its own, I contend. Therefore, if what Ragnar did in taking the money from the thief and giving it to Reardon was correct, then just taking it from the thief alone was correct also. He didn't have to give it to Reardon. The fact that he gave it to Reardon was heroic. Heroic means over and above the call of duty. But I don't think he had to. I don't see that reason. Yeah. Right, exactly. we, have, we have time for, for one more question. And I don't know if you had, nobody seems to have any questions on sex. This must be a very, very happy audience here. We have. 
lot there. If you're familiar with the North American Man Boy Love Association, and what do you think of them? <laughs> <laughs> This will be a special chapter in the new book. Yeah. <laughs> the North American Man-Boy Love Association. Yes, I am uh, familiar with it. Uh, my views on that are, are, I take it to be the libertarian views. Uh, the libertarian views is anything between consenting adults is legitimate. Now, the question is, when does a boy become a man, or when does a child become an adult? An, an adult? And there are various theories on child theory. Uh, when does a child become an adult, and what are the responsibilities of parents to children? And some answers are arbitrary, like uh, in the Christian church, it's when you're confirmed, and that could be at age 11 or 10, or maybe you could even interpret it as baptized when you're, you know, all of two weeks old or something. And the Jewish religion is 13 when you're born mitzvah. In uh, some assessments, it could be 21 when you're allowed to vote. But I think that the problem with all of these is that you can find adults who are not as mature and sophisticated as 10-year-olds. Uh, certainly, uh, stupidity is rampant, as Dr. Wilson is telling us, so I need not prove that case uh, any further. I think the libertarian answer to the child question is uh, based on our homesteading theories. Now, we know what homesteading is with regard to a virgin land. You mix your labor with it and you get to own it according to the Lockean principles. I think that a similar type of situation occurs with children, and that is when they homestead themselves by seizing control over themselves by becoming independent, by running away from home and maybe making a contract with an uncle or an aunt or a grandparent, or by running away from home and, and getting a job. That's why child labor legislation uh, it would be inappropriate, because children are not allowed to prove themselves in the marketplace. So I would say that if a boy uh, can be self-supporting, he is an adult, and as an adult he can have a sexual liaison with uh, another same sex or opposite sex or whatever. I guess uh, the only ones that don't discriminate on the basis of sex would be what is it? Uh, homosexuals discriminate against same sex. Heterosexual, no. Homosexuals discriminate against the opposite sex. Heterosexuals discriminate against the same sex. The only people that don't discriminate are bisexuals. But they discriminate on other grounds other than sex, namely friendship or kinship or what have you. So I think that that, that would be my answer. Uh, if we had a boy um, who was independent, he would be an adult, and then he could get into whatever relationship, heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual. I'd like to thank uh, Drs. Block, and Wilson, and Demento for the most entertaining afternoon here. And I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the convention. Thank you.